Does your vision for business match what you see happening on a daily basis? Welcome to Jim White's Circle of Success Show, where Jim White brings it all together. For over 30 years, Jim White has worked with organizations and individuals worldwide to help develop and implement excellence. You'll get the inside story on how to create innovative leaders from one corner of your company to the other. Get everyone on your team contributing to the bottom line. Keep building revenue, even when the economy and your customers have flatlined, and more. Jim White's Circle of Success show covers it all, from communication to contract negotiation, from personal fulfillment to revving up cash flow. It's not about theories. It's about showing what works and how to make it work for you. And now, here's your host, Jim White. Thank you, David, and welcome to the show. We have a fantastic show for you today, ladies and gentlemen. We have two uh, uh, friends. Uh, I have a lot of respect for these two men, and they are Stephen M. R. Covey and Greg Link. They're the authors of their new book, Smart Trust. Well, what can I say about uh, Stephen and Greg? What I'm going to do, uh, you're seeing on the screen now, that beautiful cover, uh, Smart Trust. And you probably recall, I believe it was 2006, 2008, in that area, uh, where Stephen had released the, uh, uh, the book, at Speed of Trust. Every time I'm in front of an audience and uh, coaching, I'm always talking about the Speed of Trust. And now we got this new update to Smart Trust. When I asked Stephen and to Greg to join us on, uh, for the show today, uh, I, I just thought it was very appropriate uh, early in January 2012, and they just released a book uh, January the 12th, uh, which has already gone to number one bestseller uh, in all the major uh, uh, retailers, Amazon and Borders, et cetera, to no surprise. Why? Because there's such a need for this, uh, this information. And today... Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, both Greg and Stephen joining us via Skype uh, from a, uh, a retreat that they're at in Hawaii with the Transformational Leadership Council. So they have uh, graciously uh, stepped away and going to be with the hour. We're also blessed to have these thinkers, and especially in this economic uh, challenge that we have, and especially coming into the 2012 presidential cycle. But what I'm going to do before I bring uh, uh, Greg and Lincoln uh, and, and uh, Stephen, excuse me, excuse me if I can talk th this afternoon, I'm holding up the book now, and what I want to do is just to read you uh, some uh, accolades uh, from some wonderful um, uh, CEOs and thought leaders. And, and, and I'm going to start off with uh, Randall Stevenson, just rank order. Here's the chairman and president of, and CEO of AT&T. Randall says, uh, we've turned to Stephen M. R. Covey to help us train more than 100,000 AT&T managers. I recommend Smart Trust to anyone trying to succeed in today's fast-paced global business environment. Smart Trust demonstrates that trust is the key to our global reality. This powerful book shows how to reign in trust, prosper, and experience more energy and joy in the process. I highly recommend it. This is from 2006 Nobel Prize winner Muhammad Yunus. Then we have Larry King uh, says about smart trust, powerfully shows us how to increase trust, which is more important than ever in this low trust world. And that's, that's a terminology that we're going to be drilling down on, which uh, Stephen and Greg, when they come live. The best leaders I've ever met have the ability to create trust. Smart trust is a great read. This is an important addition to your library, Larry King. And that goes on and on and on about the accolades of this book. And I would love to now... Welcome, uh, Stephen M. R. Covey and Greg Link to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Well, th th thank you, Jim. It's fantastic to be with you on this show, Circle of Success. So thank you for hosting us. Uh, my, yeah, my, I love my, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Like a, 
like I said, we are uh, in technology. We've got split, uh, smart screens. So like I said, live television always gives us some challenge, but this is part of the process. So we're just going to have fun, and Greg, we'll keep uh, working on your video to come up, okay? All right, sir, no worries. Okay. I tell you what, you guys are great. I, I was so excited uh, when the opportunity presented itself uh, to uh, get you two on the show because I know how – busy a schedule that you uh keep uh steven you guys are traveling you're you're constantly around the world but man what a wonderful message uh, and and smart trust and uh, speed of trust give our audience a little bridge if you will why smart trust because speed of trust is still right next to my bedside has been there for years I pick it up just about every day, literally, and pick up something. So now we come out with Smart Trust. So tell us a little bit about Smart Trust, and then we'll dig down, and we'll just start uh, 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 talking about uh, what it is and what it is not. All right. All right. Great. Great. Well, well, first, first of all, all Jim, Speed of trust there, never fear that. So I'm glad you did that. That's, that's tremendous. But the idea of trust is really trying to help people learn how to navigate with high trust in such a low trust world. And that's the whole premise is that almost everywhere we turn today, we see a loss of trust. We see a loss of trust in our institutions in media, in government, with the parties, we see a lot of trust in business, education, and healthcare. And we also see people not believing that they can trust other people, a lot of trust in society. And that's kind of our new context, our new reality. And so the whole premise is that, yes, it's a low trust world. That's one side of the coin, but the other side is showing that there are people, there are leaders, there are organizations everywhere that have learned how to operate and are succeeding with high trust. In fact, in spite of the fact that they're in a low trust world. So that's kind of the other side of the coin. So the question is, how do they do it? Who's doing it? How are they doing it? What are they doing? And can I do it too, as a listener, as a reader? So that's the idea, is to help people bridge that gap between a low trust world and yet, showing the, the data showing overwhelmingly that the great success flows from high trust. So how do you do it smartly? How do you do it successfully, navigate with high trust in a low trust world? And that's the idea behind smart trust. You know, Stephen, um, as I read the book and uh, keep going back, and you start off right up front, and you call it a, the great paradox. That's what you just laid out, is how to develop trust in a low-trust world. Is that what you mean by that? Exactly. That, that the great paradox is that simple fact that here we are in the midst of an extraordinary crisis of trust. And yet... Okay, we're having audio, uh, audio issues. At, this, at the same time, simultaneously, there are people, there are leaders, there are organizations even nations that are operating with high trust in the midst of this low trust world. And that's a paradox where two seemingly contradictory ideas are taking place at once. And we like to express it this way, Greg and I, that the paradox is that at the same time we're seeing a crisis of trust, we're also simultaneously seeing a renaissance. And that's perfect. Yeah. Um. We are having some techno audio difficulty. Uh, Dave, is there anything going on our end? Or uh, Stephen? Uh, Stephen, yes. we're, we've, we've lost your audio. Uh, okay. Nicole. Jim, do you have mine? This is Greg. Yeah, you got great audio for you. So, uh, well, should I pick up? You, where you betcha. He's, uh, you betcha. Great, great idea. Greg, this is Greg right. Link. Uh, okay, good enough. Yeah, and what? At the same time, we, we uh, have this low trust that we're experiencing. Everywhere we turn, everybody's so confused. The, we've identified a lot of outliers, companies and organizations and people that in the same circumstances are causing so many others to fail. They're uh, having extraordinary success. 
One of the examples that we use is uh, the book. He uh, started a company called Zappos. Right, right. They went from nothing to a billion dollars in revenue in the worst economic decade in history this last 10 years. And so in the same circumstances that everyone else was struggling, Zappos, with a very peculiar business model, as a matter of fact, maybe you know and your viewers know the story, uh, they're selling shoes to women online and giving them free shipping to uh, return them. So as a businessman, Jim, that business model could have sounded a little bit difficult to fund in the beginning, yeah. but it's been extraordinarily successful. I talked to Tony J. Uh, I asked him, I said, well, how are you able to do this? And he says, I did it with two things. I, I extended trust to my employees. They've got an extraordinary way to do that. They have their managers spend 15 to 20 percent of their time off campus uh, bonding and, and recreating with their employees because under the premise that you'll do things for friends you wouldn't necessarily do for customers or uh, uh, co-workers. And the second is that he trusted his customers, and that's the, what I mentioned earlier about the fact that they had uh, paid for the shipping both ways for people, their customers, to return their, their uh, merchandise. So that's a, a just a in-your-face example of how in the same, this paradox of low trust, everybody's back on their heels, afraid to, afraid to invest, afraid to hire anybody. Uh, in the same circumstances, there are uh, these outliers of success that we've identified that uh, are having extraordinary success. Hmm. I love that example, uh, Greg, uh, but I'm, I'm going to put my banker's hat on just for a little bit. <laughs> okay. And you come to me with that business model, I'm going to say, okay, sounds great. <laughs> How am I going to measure this thing? And uh, so what's the measures in place? Uh, because, I mean, you guys, we know each other well enough to know that, man, I, I bleed. If you don't have trust, I mean, you, you're in trouble. And I'm always talking about being able to connect trust to the bottom line. Uh, in fact, are. that is the stock market, right? It's driven by confidence and trust. So... How do we, I mean, there's such great examples in the book. Uh, I mean, where you give the example on page 24 about the uh, trust in happiness and then on page 50, uh, trust in nation. So talk a little bit about the measure. Can you do that, uh, Greg or Stephen, either one? I'll try and then we'll see if we've got Stephen's audio okay. back. But just to okay. start it off, um, yeah, the, the, and this straight to the stock market, which you brought up. Yeah. The uh, research shows from multiple different sources that high trust companies outperform low trust companies in total return to share, shareholders by almost three times. So the evidence is overwhelming that this has an economic, even though it's counterintuitive. Stephen, is your audio back? Do you want to uh, add to that? Three, three, three times. I, I tell you what we'll do, we'll do guys. We've got to get a break in. And while we're getting a break, uh, Stephen and Greg, uh, and, and maybe you've got your wonderful Holly behind the scenes that are, uh, see if we can uh, work the, on the tweak on the uh, audio and, and video on your end because we, we have a good feed from the studio. So uh, bear with us, and uh, we'll get in this break, and we'll, we'll be right back. So you're watching KYMB TV, Comcast Channel 19. We'll be right back with Stephen and Greg Link right after this message. Are you looking for a clarity of purpose? Are you a recent college graduate, unemployed, an entrepreneur, or considering a career change, a business owner or employee struggling with performance issues? Classes are forming now for the worldwide phenomenon, What's My Purpose Life Mastery Course 2.0. What's My Purpose Life Mastery Course 2.0 can help you define your goals and vision. Start living your life on purpose. Living on purpose is about joy. Living on purpose is about intention. Living on purpose is about personal transformation and continued growth. What's My Purpose Life Mastery Course 2.0 is a 12-week challenging course that helps you address finances, relationships, spiritual growth, physical and mental health. You will reclaim your personal power and get your life on track to attain true success. Classes are forming now for What's My Purpose Life Mastery Course 2.0. Learn more. Register at What's My Purpose. 
Okay, we're back uh, with Stephen M. R. Covey and Greg Link, the authors of Smart Trust. And like I said, uh, Greg and uh, Stephen is joining the show today live from via Skype, and we're uh, we're having some issues both audio and video. And what we may do, guys, if uh, if it doesn't come back up in this session, uh, uh, maybe we can have both of you to call in, and we'll get you on the phone in the studio, and we will uh, put up a picture so we know what we can do because this content is so so critical. Boy, you're looking good, Greg. You're we're, you're on the screen, and you're looking great here. Uh, so, welcome back, so, Greg. I can see you, Stephen. Uh, you there? I, I am here. Can you okay. see me or hear me? I, I got great audio, so we're going to continue. And we have your we're, we we got a beautiful shot up of of your uh, your 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 person here, and I see uh, Greg's live with his video. So, uh, isn't it isn't it great how we do this stuff? We just go with it and make it make make it happen. We adapt. I love it. Trust. And that's what our trust is all about, Jim. That you know, you, we were talking about the economics of it. Yep. And uh, it's it's that the trust measured by the due diligence. We're not talking about blind trust and being stupid about it. You said that's a, a tricky business model. We really uh, are advocating that you learn the skill to balance the propensity to trust with the analysis, and you find a sweet spot of judgment and smart trust. So it, it really does provide a, a real live, real time skill in any circumstances to make the best best call you can. Now you're not going to be right 100 percent of the time. I mean, there is risk in trusting people. We acknowledge that and we know that. And there's <laughs> right. risk in many business calls. Yeah, boy, is it in, in that in that the truth, uh, Stephen? Um, when you you go out, and I mean, you, you, like I said, you guys are traveling all the time, and you're speaking to groups around the world. Um, you also had an opportunity to speak, I believe it was in 2008, at the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, you have uh, some folks that uh, endorsed your book, uh, specifically, uh, well, uh, Muhammad Yunus was at the last 2010 Davos, and when they were doing a panel uh, with, um, uh, I think it was uh, Jim Quigley, am I pronouncing that right, the CEO of Deloitte, which has also endorsed the book? Uh, yes. And that whole panel was basically around trust. Uh, so when we're sitting in these type of environments and, and we, we look at the challenges that we have globally, and especially in the Middle East, how in the world are we going to allow this trust to ground hold with these different cultures? What do you, what do you see? Is this question making sense to you? Sure. Yeah. What do we, I know it's a complex. It's a it's a, it's a very complex question, but you know, for the show. But how are we seeing it? But and and how does that align to uh, the graphs that you have in the book on uh, uh, trust and happiness and the trust in nations and, and that type of thing? Can you speak to that, please? Absolutely. Well, let me say this, Jim, that Greg talked about how trust has a clear impact on the economic business. Okay. That's the economic impact, three times higher. So there's a similar on that also is taking place in some conditions. Stephen, I hate I hate to do this, but we're we're getting bad audio from you. Please, okay. uh, Greg, can you pick that up? And uh, Stephen, can you call into the studio so we got you on a hard line, please? I will, I will do that. Okay, thank you, sir. Greg, very good. You? Yes, I will pick it up. And uh, yeah, it, it dabbles. It's very interesting because this was a couple of years ago, right at the same yeah. weekend that the economic crisis. Uh, was in play, and all the senators and congressmen and parliaments around the world were meeting. And at the same time, we're at Davos with representatives from 90 other countries, 2,000 participants. And at the end of the conference, we had an opportunity to select what was the biggest restraining force for the coming year, which at that point was 2009. Right. And the financial crisis actually came in number two. They picked trust, the crisis of trust and confidence as the number one restraining force You're there. of the upcoming uh, year. And uh, that was indicative for us to see how 
extraordinarily important trust and confidence is to the economy, not just the profits, right, but the right. underlying basis. Because the banks guaranteed liquidity, but the banks still wouldn't loan, or the government guaranteed liquidity, right. uh, but the banks still wouldn't loan to each other because they were right. uh, you know, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And that same uh, aspect of trust translates into businesses, yep. relationships, teams, all the different uh, interactions that we have in business. Okay. Uh, I think we have Stephen on the studio line. Stephen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me here now? We, 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 we can. Uh, we, we can. Um, to our viewers, uh, uh, we have such wonderful viewers around the world, and they, they understand, and, and the content's so great. So they, they're forgiven on our audio and our video stuff. So we're doing great. Greg, um, in, at that time when you were explaining, you know, for Davos, you're right. When, when all the credit come down because, I mean, nobody trusted anyone. Well, we're having a similar situation in Europe. Uh, on my radio show and other shows I've been doing in the past year, two years, has to do with the polarization in Congress and Senate and, and, and the White House and, 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 and all of those things. And I'm going to, it's kind of like Larry King says, you heard it here first. You know, what in the world can we do to get our candidates to start talking about smart trust? And um, uh, that's, that's probably a mouthful, but. Uh, we, we have an have an opportunity, uh, and Stephen, if you'd turn off your uh, mic off your Skype, that would be great. We would not get feedback. That would be great. Um, okay. Very good. Very good. So, uh, so many wonderful things here. Such an important message. Uh, so, is anybody since the release from any of the campaign said? Mr. Covey and Mr. Link, how can we tie this into what I call the new manifesto? Or, uh, in, in, in my mind, we, we got to take this wonderful work and we got to create a more of a compelling vision for America if we're going to continue to be leaders. And I think the foundation is right here in, in trust. So I said a whole bunch of stuff. Anybody want to grab it? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll start real quick. Um, basically, the, here's the good news, and this is all spelled out in the book. We've identified, as we've interacted with all these different leaders all over the world, we've identified five actions that they take that are common to leaders in all industries and in all different circumstances. And it's right. those five things would pl apply equally to a presidential candidate, to another country, uh, uh, and given all examples. So it gives us a little bit of hope that there is uh, a way through this, that we can just model these outliers and they'll guide us right uh, right through it. Just like all throughout history, uh, the economy has come and gone and the high trust leaders have prevailed over and over and over I agree. again. I, I agree. Uh, Stephen, to you, and uh, uh, Greg uh, teed it up here, uh, five actions of smart trust. Choose to believe is action number one, if I recall correctly. That's correct. Choose to believe and trust. Yeah. What? Uh, tell us more about that. Choose to believe. Believe in well, self. Believe in trust. Believe in others. Choose to believe. Choose to believe and trust. And here's the idea. It is saying that trust is a decision. It is a choice that we make. We choose to believe and trust. It is a better way to live. That it's a better way to lead, that you get better outcomes. And the opposite of that is someone that basically believes that lying, cheating, and stealing is a better way to operate. And you know, the way of it as far as you can, as long as you can, and that you get better outcomes. Compared to saying, I believe that creating trust, inspiring trust, being worthy of trust, is really trust is a better way to lead. And there's a couple of key beliefs, and let me share one of them. Please. One of them is this. The belief that most people can be trusted. Now, I didn't say everybody, because not everyone can. We know that. We see that all the time. But there's plenty of people that can't be. But most people want to be. Most people can. And when you walk into the premise of that, you open yourself up to possibilities that you can't see if you start from the premise of you can't trust anybody. 
And, and too often what we've had happen is we've allowed the minority of people that we can't trust to define for us the majority of the people that we can. And so in our companies, we design our rules and our regulations, our policies and our procedures for the 5 or 10 percent that we can't trust and not for the 90 or 95 percent that we can't. And we penalize the many because of the few. And we pay a constant, we, we pay a price for that. So let me give you a great illustration of a business that operates on the premise that most people can be trusted and is built an extraordinary business, and that's eBay. Think about eBay. Yep, yep, yep. Online, great example. Online auction. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're not that old. They're, what, 15 years or so? But, but they, there's a million transactions taking place every day on eBay. Isn't that amazing? These are between buyers and sellers that have never met each other. They don't know each other. And yet they've created a process that creates trust between them. But Pierre Omidyar, their founder, he obviously the people are basically good and that most people can basically be trusted. Boy, I, I tell you, that just gave me chills. That's right. Think about that. Think about one million transactions a day. Is that what you said, Stephen? Email? Sure. And we've never met each other? And we're doing this transaction in some wild space world of internet and pushing buttons? That's right. Wow. Then why didn't I figure that out? That model, right? It was like, a, what, 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 a, what, what a great model. So again, trust. And you also state very clearly in the book, and, and I think both of you have addressed this to some, some degree about not blind trust. I mean, some people, geez, not a chance. But for as organizations are concerned, the sooner you can firm up uh, those players that you want to have on your team and recruit to based on that measure, that's where that, uh, uh, that's where that success comes in. And I think Greg said the return uh, from, from Wall Street for the companies that has this high trust and this low trust world is three to one return. Well, that's a pretty good return if you can, uh, you know, uh, tie it back to the smart trust. Uh, absolutely. In fact, let me, I'll use eBay as an illustration of why it's smart trust and not blind trust. They, their premise is most people can be trusted. Right. They build a business for that. But they also know that not everyone can. There's always a few people out there that are going to try to cheat the system and, and, and defraud it. So they're very vigilant about it. And they have an anti-fraud division that goes after the cheat. They create a rating system, too, like most people know, where there's a rating. If someone gets too low a rating, they get voted off the island, so to speak. Right, they right, right, right. The right. They can't participate. And they go after the cheaters. And, and But what they don't do is allow the cheaters to poison the entire business. Instead, they isolate them. They go after them. They try to kick, they kick them out. They vote them off the island. And they focus on the many that can be trusted. And they don't allow the few that can't be to ruin it for the many that can't. But, but it would be blind trust to not be aware that there's many that can't be trusted and, and that there's some that can't be trusted. It would be blind trust if you just thought, you know what, everyone will be fine. No, they start from the premise, most people can be trusted. Now, let's design a system for the most people, and let's also design safeguards against those that can't be, the few, so that we don't allow the few to spoil it for the many. And that's why it's smart trust, because they balance the propensity to trust with analysis, their heart with their head. It gives them good judgment. They found the sweet spot. Yeah. They're prospering as a result, and it's smart trust. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that. And uh, heart in the head, heart in the head, heart in the head. The blending of them, the integration of it, the harmonizing of them. Yeah. That's the judgment that comes with smart trust. And, and But I'll tell you what, if you, if you don't begin with that high propensity to trust, the heart, the openness, then you won't even see the possibilities. They'll be foreclosed to you. They won't even come up. You won't even see them. And too many people start with, with the analysis first, and they find all the reasons why they can't trust anyone. And, and, and they project that now on everyone, and they don't operate with trust in their world. And so this is a way to, to make it, to find that sweet spot 
without getting burned, without taking too much risk, but open yourself up to the possibilities. High propensity to trust balanced with equally high analysis. That's heart balanced with head. The harmonizing of the two, that's smart trust. You know, I I, I, I love that, Stephen, and uh, we, we've lost Greg and... Uh, uh, so we'll we'll continue and see if we can reconnect here, okay? Uh, but what I want to do, and I and 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 I'm going to use Randall Stevenson just for example. I mean, no no reason. So uh, we're not picking on anybody here, but since he got the testimony here and you and, and you've worked with him, okay? Um, you work with, uh, according to Randall, over 100,000 of his people, or Franklin Covey, your organization, and uh, has. When you've had a conversation, say, with Randall, and you're talking about heart, does he look at you like, hmm, what are you talking about? That's not hard science? Or how does he respond to that connection of heart and the head as it relates to trust? Well, I'll tell you what. Randall is open to it because okay. here's the key is that I'm not saying that we ignore the analysis, right. but that we, that we throw it away. I right. know I'm saying, no, we got to have it. It'd be stupid not to. It'd be blind trust not to. What I am saying is be open to the possibilities of having a high propensity to trust. Because if you can create trust, will you get better results? Randall relates to that because he knows, he, and he said this himself, he said, the only way we're going to create trust is to look in the mirror at ourselves first and ask, can people trust me? Yeah. And do I give others a person they can trust, a leader they can trust? And so he gets it, that start with creating trust, but you got to make sure that you balance it with, you know, a good analysis. Like you say, the banker's hat that you were talking about. Right. That you got to, you can't just go out and trust everyone or else right. you get burned. But at the same time, um, if you're not open to the possibility, you won't even see what could happen you won't even be um you, you, you won't uh, it won't cross your radar and you'll be foreclosed from you so so a, a guy like Randall stevenson is actually a pretty uh enlightened leader in the sense that he understands that trust is an inside out process and it's yep. got to start with each of us you've got to look in the mirror that's the famous line from randall yeah that he said to his team he said look if we want to increase trust on our team then each of us starting with me needs to look in the mirror love it Love it. I trust myself, and am I giving to my team a leader they can trust? Well, uh, we're going to have to get another break in here, and I'm going to try to. We're going to try to get Greg reconnected here, and uh, Greg, I'm going to give you another number to call in: eight three one two three six eight one seven six. So maybe try that number, and we'll keep uh, we'll we'll keep trying to get everybody connected here. You know, we, like I said, uh, let's get a quick break in while we're uh, uh, trying to make the connection. But uh, when, when we come back, uh, Stephen, uh, I want to pick up with this uh, action uh, number two, and what you're just talking about, uh, start with sell. Yep. So you're, uh, bear with us. We'll be right back after this message. You're, you're watching KYMB TV, Comcast Channel 19, and we're streaming live at JLWCOS.TV. We'll be right back after this message with Stephen M. R. Covey and Greg Link, the authors of Smart Trust. Business is constantly changing. The challenges of the 21st century have never been greater. There is competition in every field, and technology is more fluid than ever. Bold, innovative thinking is needed. Organizations and individuals are looking for leadership, opportunity, and a way to grow. That way is finally here. I love teaching. I love sharing. I love sharing from the heart. 
connect him when I caught the heart in the head. Hundreds of companies and thousands of people have been inspired by one man. Even from nothing you can accomplish, if you have the will, if you have the perseverance, if you will work hard on setting goals and achieving those goals and holding yourself accountable to each and every one of those goals. Jim White has dedicated his life to inspiring excellence in people. A plus. The man was knowledgeable. He had lived everything he talked about. He was extremely sincere. He was succinct and he was inspirational. He's given me some thought and some ideas on how to reset my goals and how to restructure my life. A hugely successful businessman himself, Jim decided years ago to share his knowledge. Over the past 30 years, Jim White has mentored everyone from Fortune 500 CEOs to small business owners. He has helped numerous companies and individuals achieve their financial and personal goals. His circle of success is a blueprint for excellence and achievement. I got the strong feeling that Mr. White was speaking from uh, a huge amount of experience built up over the decades, which I think adds a lot of dimension to this kind of a seminar. He wants to make you get up and do something tomorrow <laughs> about changing your life. J.L. White International is a management consulting and leadership development organization. Through workshops and one-to-one -one training, Jim and his staff have inspired audiences all over the country and have been able to achieve remarkable results by focusing on human capital and designing customized solutions to increase revenue and productivity. J.L. White International is guaranteed to inspire excellence. Isn't it time you discovered what true excellence in business is really like? Okay, we're back. We're back with uh, Stephen M. R. Covey and Greg Link, the authors of Smart Trust. And uh, we want to thank all of our viewers around the world. And uh, guys, I don't know where you know this, but uh, through our streaming at uh, JLWCOS.TV, we stream in over 200 countries right now. So we know this is going to be picked up and a great message for a lot of folks around the world. So, um, Stephen, um, five actions. Uh, Start with self. A uh, little bit more about that, please, if you will. Yes, yes. Okay, so start with self is the second action. See, the, the first action, choose to believe and trust. That's the paradigm. Right. Mindset. Okay. Now, so what's the foundation? What do I do then? I start with my. I start with self. And, and that's the Randall Stevenson uh, question we were talking about. Right. Look into, you look into the mirror. And the key thing here is to ask two questions. First, do I trust myself? Hmm. I trust myself. And let me tell you why that's important, Jim. It, yeah, yeah. If you don't trust yourself, at the end of the day, you'll have a hard time sustaining trust with others. If, if a leader, if a manager doesn't trust him or herself, at some point they tend to project distrust out into relationships, into their teams, under the organizations. And, and so... Um, it, it, can, it can affect the whole way in which you view it. But when you do start with a sense of self-trust, it doesn't mean it's perfect, but, but there's a sense of clarity, of integrity, of self-trust, then that gives you a perspective and, and clarity of how to view externally others. And it's far easier to create trust with others. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, the sec and by the way, sometimes people call that self-confidence, um, it, but it's self-trust. I was actually going to ask for that clarification, Stephen. Uh, so that is what you're talking about, is uh, trust in self, um, uh, make decisions, or self-confidence, or... or it's, it's, a trust, it's a trust in yourself around your ability, around both your character okay. and your competence. Right, right. Love it. You keep commitments to yourself. Character and competence. Char character and competence. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and so you trust that you keep commitments, and you also trust that you you're you're growing, you're learning, you're getting better, you're improving, so you're capable, you're competent, and that combination creates a sense of self confidence. In fact, Greg and I tell a story in the book um, of Magic Johnson, the great basketball player that played for the Los Angeles Lakers many years ago. Yep. When he when he was a rookie, his first year in the league, and 
it's game five, and they just uh, um, they won the game, but they lost their star player, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He gets hurt, and so the team is worried. You know, we're not going to win anymore. Everyone was hanging their heads. They were down because they lost Kareem, the star player. Right, right. The league. And Magic Johnson tells the team, come on, I know why you're all discouraged, because we lost Kareem. Well, guess what? He says, I'll be Kareem. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so he gets on the plane to fly to, to Boston where they're playing the game, and he sits in Kareem's seat, seat 1A. You know, no one love it. Yeah. sits in Kareem's seat. He sits right, because he's going to be Kareem. And he's a point guard, and he goes and he plays center. He plays Kareem's position. And as a rookie, and in the final game, in that he scores 42 points and gets 15 rebounds, playing out of position as a center, replacing Kareem, and then he, he, at the end of the game, he, he looks into the camera and says, this one's for you, big fella, back to Kareem. <laughs> and, Love it. Uh, but, but that kind of self-trust, self-confidence that came out of both his character and his competence inspired not only him, he ultimately could translate that kind of confidence to the team. And, and that's, what, that's what happens if you start with yourself. Yeah. And, then, and so the related question to that is you give to others a person they can trust. See, so Magic gave to his teammates a teammate that they could trust. Right, he trusted right. his character, that right. he cared about them. He trusted his confidence that he could deliver on yeah. what he said he was going to do. And he did. Yeah. He was green. And, and the same thing happens in business. It happens in life. We're looking for those leaders that know how to start with themselves and look in the mirror and they give to others, they give to the people that they lead, a person, a leader, a, a, a teammate that they can trust. And that's a, that's the better starting point. Then, then let me give you the opposite. The opposite is people that say, hey, you know what, we'll never build trust around here because of the boss. Or we'll yeah. never build trust around here because of management. And they, and they always point the finger and blame everybody else to, as to why there can't be trust. And they may be true, they might be accurate that the boss is a problem or the management is a problem, but you're never going to solve the problem by pointing the finger instead of looking in the mirror. How you'll solve it is to look into the mirror and to work from the inside out where you become um, highly influential because of your personal credibility, like Magic did, and have that ripple out into uh, your relationships, into your team, into your group, into the teams you interact with, and you watch that ripple throughout an organization or throughout a society, for that matter. Mm -hmm. It's always an inside-out process. Mm -hmm. Boy, I, I love it. Uh, Greg, you you have a live mic as well, so jump in any time, please. Yeah, no, I will. I, uh, he's, he's, you've got it. No, oh, I tell you, he's on I'll the road. Take the next action. How's that, Jim? You 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 got it. Uh, so that uh, yeah. uh, and and that next action is going to be declare your intent. Well, you guys are in a in, in a wonderful space, and the meeting that you're in is just full of in, intent and energy and, and uh, folks, right? So, uh, how about that one? Declare your intent. Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, your listeners may or may not know, or your viewers may not know, that Stephen and I actually came at this as practitioners. Stephen was the CEO right. of uh, what became the largest leadership development organization in the world, and uh, we operated the business. Uh, and so we come at this from a very pragmatic uh, side. And one of the most pragmatic actions that we found that is common to these high trust uh, people around the world is that they declare their intent. They're very transparent. This confidence that comes from starting with themselves uh, gives them the opportunity to examine their motive and to desire a mutual benefit. And by coming from that uh, transparent and authentic position, they're able to declare their intent. If you can imagine, uh, uh, and there's two parts to this. I'll get to the second one in a second. But the, okay. the first part is declaring your intent. And if you're in a a sales situation in all business at one level is uh, trying to make your case to another party and influence them. And when you do that, you have your pitch, your presentation, and and uh, we have a tendency to launch into that and not really be clear to the other party where we're going with it. And so unless you declare your intent, it really takes the sword out of their hand if you just lay out all your cards and are completely transparent and say, listen, here's not only what I want to talk to you about, but here's why. Here's the reasons behind it, and here's how I think this is mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. And just show your, your hand, so to speak. Now, that's way counterintuitive to most business people who feel like they'll be taken advantage of, that they'll end up uh, uh, getting the 
less of a good deal than they could have if they would have been a little bit more uh, coy about it. But unless you do that, Jim, unless you lay out your cards and they're transparent, the other person's not listening to your presentation anyway. They're back on their heels wondering, now where's Jim going with this? You yeah. know? When's the other shoe going to drop? When, yeah. when is he or she yeah. going to show me what they're really after? And so by declaring your intent, it actually gives you a tremendous advantage in any uh, business communication or any kind of communication. Now the flip side, I said there were two parts. The other side is to assume positive intent in others. And this is one that uh, uh, my wife, Annie, really helps me with. When I'm driving, I always assume that uh, the other driver looked me right in the eyes and pulled right in front of me deliberately. <laughs> and she always chimes in with the possibility that uh, maybe they didn't, that was not their intent, that <laughs> maybe they didn't see me or they have a sick child or there's some other motivation for their behavior. So the whole idea of assuming positive intent in others giving them the benefit of the doubt, assuming, as Stephen talked about before when he was talking about eBay, that all people are basically good, that basic assumption, that propensity to trust, where you always want to start. But again, smart trust is not naive in, in Pollyanna. You, you start there and assume positive intent, but you still want to do your due diligence and, and be smart about it. But uh, Indra Newey, who wrote the foreword for this book, Jim, yep. says that that Great was the forward. most important lesson she ever learned from her father was to assume positive intent in others. So the, the one-two punch of declaring your intent and assuming your positive intent in others really, really does have a huge impact on your ability to influence people and, and uh, have uh, benefit and, and uh, not only the energy and joy we talk about in the subtitle, but also the prosperity and, and the results. Uh, boy, such powerful stuff, uh, uh, Greg. I want to uh, just drill down one of my favorite words a little bit more and, and, and for our audience to really understand uh, what you said, that you and Stephen are so different than most authors, and we have a lot of great author friends jointly, but you guys are so different because you have been in the trenches. You know what it's like to run an organization. You've done it. So to me, that's where the tremendous amount of credibility is added to this whole process. And, and, and I think you see that. That's the reason you have some of the top uh, political leaders of the world and also uh, top uh, CEOs uh, will, will take you serious. Uh, you find that to be the case, Stephen? I do think it's, it's very helpful because um, we're coming at it when you do come at it as a practitioner, then it's seen sometimes as just more tested, more practical, and not as a, as a theory. And I think that we're more grounded in that thinking. So our yeah. whole approach is to, is to really focus on what works. Yeah. That's why the, the whole idea of trust is that, hey, this is not just a nice thing to do, you know, go out and trust everyone. Now, we're, we're coming at it from the standpoint, you're going to get better results. You're going to get better outcomes. You're going to move faster with trust and with, at lower cost. And that's practical. It's also practical how you do it. And, and then that last action that Greg just described, to right. prepare your intent, right. that is so practical. Yeah. And, and we're coming at this saying, look, the research validates that creating that kind of transparency builds trust, but also our practice does. And I'll bet our listeners' practice does and our viewers. Yeah. That they're saying, gosh, yeah, that yes, Oftentimes there's negotiations and it's kind of people are playing their cards, you know, holding their cards close to the vest, so to speak, and they don't disclose much. And, and it's kind of a tit-for-tat guessing game, a back-and-forth. But the, the problem is that, that, uh, that there's a lot of projection, a lot of guessing. What if you could change the nature of the game? What if you could declare your intent of, hey, here's our agenda, here's our motive, here's what we're trying to do, here's why. Here's why we want to negotiate differently. Now, not everyone's going to go for it. And, and again, you're not going to find trust with this. So you got to right. be smart. If someone doesn't go for it, then you can play the other game, too. But you can change the game, and you can say, look, let's do a deal that we both feel good about. It's win-win or no deal. And that's, that's coming out of practice. We've been there. We've done it. And we've seen people do it. And that's exciting. And I do think people resonate with it. And, and um, just declare your intent is a good place where that actually gets put in practice time and time again. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, as the years, uh, as we become more seasoned, right, that's what I like to say, versus getting older. 
<laughs> who come more see Thanks, you. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this this really resonates and 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 and, and guys as, as you can I cannot be any happier for both of you uh, for your team and and I know you have a wonderful support system in your family and and, and all the great people back at work uh, and and I can just see this moving forward in 2012 I just continue to get the message and let people know this is real there's no magic pills here but this is a roadmap not only for your business for your relationships uh, your families, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And we're running out of time. we got 10 minutes, and we're going to forego uh, a couple of things here just to make sure we can uh, get some more stuff in here, especially uh, do what you say when you say it. Is there or something? I'm paraphrasing, so I hope I didn't butcher it too bad. But what, what's that all about? Do what you say. Well, this is the fourth action. Yep. So the third action, you declare your intent. Now the fourth action, you do what you just said you're going to do. You declared it, now do it. It's very simple. And, and, and it's funny, but here's what the data shows, that this is the action that is the best test of whether you can trust someone. Do they simply do what they say they're going to do? We worked with a big global company out of the London, a technology company. They operate in 180 countries around the world. So that's most of the world. And, and they, so they had all these different cultures, all these different value systems in all these different countries. But the CEO said this. He said, you know what? In fact, in spite of all the differences, we found there was one common test, one common standard that we can put in place as to how to gauge their performance and how we could trust them. And he said it was very simple. Did they do what they said they were going to do? And, and uh, he's nailed it because that's the act of performing, see, of delivering. I agree. The third action, declaring your intent, that builds hope. That's a promise. That's a commitment. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why. The fourth action now delivers on it. I did it. I said I was going to do it. Now I did it. And, and, and when you do that, when you say and then do, you build trust very fast. If you say and don't do, you destroy trust very fast. <laughs> so this Heartbeat. Works. Yeah. There's a lot of people that overpromise and make all kinds of grandiose promises. They do a good job on the third act, maybe, that they declare all their promises and their intent. But if they don't do the fourth one, if they don't deliver on that and they, you know, they under-deliver on their over-promise, then, then people lose trust and lose confidence. If they flat out break the commitment, it's gone almost overnight. And... And um, some people don't promise anything, don't deliver anything. They don't go anywhere in life. <laughs> you know, you know I, that that reminds me. I oft, I, I tell a lot of my clients. I said, well. Uh, we're really not looking to grow. I said, you know, it takes more work to be status quo than it does to grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get it. Do what you say. That is such a big one for me. It, you know, that is my Achilles' heels. If you tell me that you're going to do something at 1 p.m. today, I expect it. If you don't, and I'm, you may get a second opportunity, but I certainly you will not get a third. That, Jim, how you are is how many people are. That's how the majority of people are. They, they, they learn, you know, I can't trust. If they do it, if they say it, and then don't do it. But I'll tell you what, the person that says it and then does it, will <laughs> than the person that just does it. Now, I don't want to downplay the person that just kind of performs. That, that person will build trust if they just deliver, but they'll, they'll build it even faster if you tell people what you're going to do, you say it, you declare your intent, and then you deliver. The reason is because you made people aware. Right, right, right. But you, brought, you made a commitment. Right. And now you deliver on it. You brought them into it. Right. And, and they're more aware of it. They're looking for it. Then when you, when you deliver... You might even add, you know, as promised. I told you know, I, I said I was going to get back yeah. here. I'm getting back to you. Yeah. And it, it reminds people. That's right. They told me. Yeah. That's how you build, that's how you build trust. Then a new prospect or a customer is tell them you're going to do something and then do it. You know, and, and say, hey, as promised. Here's what I told you I'd get you. And and it's amazing how just little acts like that. You make a commitment. You make another commitment. Keep it. Repeat that process. Make keep repeat because an upward cycle. You can build trust. You can build it fast. 
And but be aware, you'll also lose it fast if you make the commitment and then break it. So it works in either direction. It accelerates the building of trust or it, or it uh, destroys it. And, and, uh, but it's a great natural action that most people get, but we often kind of overlook it or don't recognize how vital it is to just deliver on that every day. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's every day. And, and it, it is consistent every day. That reminds me, uh, because the opportunity for the interview kind of came up pretty rapidly, as we all know. Uh, so preparing for the show, and uh, you you have a staff a staff member uh, that just reinforced your book here. I'm, I'm talking about Holly, uh, and uh, she was up to I mean like to twelve. We were both up to midnight or one o'clock one night trying to get back you know exchange information. But you know when I said, man. They have the culture because she's doing what she said she was going to do. So that's a perfect example, and I wanted to pass that on to both uh, both of you uh, you guys. To let you know that. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Holly's great. Specific. Yeah, but doing what she said she's going to do, and and, and 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 that's a big deal. We have four minutes left. Um, we got to figure out a time to get you two in studio one of these days. Uh, continue to do a follow-up maybe we can come up with some type of panel deal so I, I just love so I just want you to know we're here to support you any way we can we have on our website guys a link to buy the book but give some websites out and tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, Franklin Covey and some of the things you do here's an opportunity to let people know how they can reach out to you to be able to take advantage of some of the services in addition to this wonderful book well, uh, Jim, this is Greg. The easiest way to do that is to just go to smarttrustbook.com. And they, uh, there's a number of uh, resources there. They can uh, hear uh, replays of a couple of other interviews we've done on uh, our television studio that might be useful since we had a little video trouble today. Yeah. And then they can also take a, a quiz, Jim. This is an interesting mm. thing where they can find out how smart they are about trust. Mm -hmm. It's a little seven question uh, self-scoring test, but it's very insightful to kind of get your head wrapped around why this is so important. And then there's some other resources. The most important thing we want to emphasize is that smart trust is a skill. It's something many of your business listeners are already good at. They're yep. already either consciously or unconsciously competent at it, but we can get better at it. Yep. And as far as uh, our partnership with Frank and Covey, we uh, and I know you've got listeners all over the world. We yep. operate in over 150 countries. So, yeah, you do. So uh, go there. They'll have an opportunity to connect if they would like a local representative to uh, speak to about this, yep. either here in North America or anywhere in the world. Yeah, I tell you what. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, Stephen. I was just, I was just to that point. Um, we're not only represented, but we actually are teaching trust, uh, speed of trust, smart trust, all throughout the world helping leaders and organizations to increase the level of trust on their teams, in their partnerships, in their relationships, within their organization. You can measure it. You can actually measure trust and to see the needle move on that. And what's happening, Jim, is this. When the trust increases within an organization, you're going to see a whole lot of other needles go up, too. Yeah. You're going to see the engagement of people increase, the energy, the ability to collaborate, to partner, to team. You're going to see speed go up. People see can happen faster. You'll see costs go down. You get rid of all kinds of bureaucracy and redundancy and excessive management structures that are designed based upon control, not based upon uh, trust. And, and uh, you see customers becoming more loyal. They stay with you longer. They refer business to you. You see employees becoming more loyal, more satisfied. Uh, so you attract and retain great people. What's amazing is simply this. If you increase trust within an organization, You'll increase everything else you want. It, it's a performance multiplier. Yep. It makes you better at everything else. Whereas low trust, just the opposite. It's a tax on everything else. So this is high leverage. It affects everything. And we think that this... Stephen, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to cut you off. We're running up against uh, another program in here. We're going to have to We're going to have to get out of here. Uh, sorry to do that. Uh uh, but I want to thank both of you uh, for joining us today, even with the techno difficulties we had. Uh, uh, you're no, wonderful. No, thank you. 
Yeah, you're wonderful. So uh, we got to go. Uh, so we'll be back next Monday. You're watching KYMB TV, Comcast Channel 19. So we'll talk to you next Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific. This has been Jim White's Circle of Success Show. Please visit our website, jlwcos.tv. Join us next time as Jim White brings it all together on Jim White's Circle of Success.